Um, <clears throat> so, welcome uh, to this event. I, we thought it would be very timely to do indeed um, uh, an event on the conference on the future of Europe. You will recall that the European Council was referring to it in its uh, um, summit conclusions of the 12th of December. Uh, a diplomat told me afterwards that the European Council did not discuss this item at all, physically, but uh, it's in the conclusions, so that we know at least they uh, had an interest in taking the conference forward. We remember also that this was a pledge by President Ursula von der Leyen, the pledge to do this and also do this in order to give Europeans a greater say on what the European Union does and how it works uh, for them. And interestingly, last week we had also um, a resolution, the 15th of January, of the European Parliament. We have a distinguished um, collaborator of the European Parliament Research Service <coughs> who can give further guidance um, on that. And interestingly, for those of you who have a subscription to Agence Europe, today in Agence Europe there was the leaked version of the communication of the Commission shaping the Conference on the Future of Europe, which is supposed to be presented tomorrow. So we're all having kind of advanced um, information in the meantime, and I think that's very good, so we can enrich the debate uh, even further. So it's going to be very interesting, European Parliament, Commission, Croatian Presidency, um, and we look forward on how they will hopefully find kind of common uh, um, understanding of how the conference needs to be uh, <coughs> conceived of. Uh, if the Commission's plan is followed, then it should kick off on the 9th of May, Europe Day, could be uh, a more beautiful day uh, to do that. I'm not going to anticipate on the discussion here, but as you will all agree, there are many open questions about this conference on the future of Europe. And I also have the impression that there are many different attitudes. I hear some people enthusiastic about the idea. I hear a lot of skepticism, especially in the diplomatic circles. I have the impression that many people say, this does not come at the right time. We don't need that now. Don't we open the treaty? Don't we open the discussion about this and that? Is that correct? Future will tell us. And of course, uh, that's also something which we really look forward for the panel members uh, to discuss with us. So without any further ado, uh, I'm going to turn and quickly present the panel members to you and then we will open uh, the whole uh, discussion. Our first panel um, intervention will be by Sylvia Kotamidis, who is uh, sitting there. She works for the European Parliamentary Research Service, as I told you. She's specifically dedicated to constitutional and legal affairs she has published on institutional topics. And in fact, if you want to have a very good overview, you should really look on the Parliament website for the briefing paper on the Conference on the Future of Europe that she published in uh, December. Very, very informative. And so she has been following this uh, debate for quite a, um, a while. And so we are really very happy that she was available to share her views and also give us updates from the European Parliament side. Apparently yesterday something interesting happened as well. Uh, so we will look forward to hear uh, from you um, as well. Then we will have, um, and it's not in order that they are seated, but I'm just taking the alphabetical order of the professors so that they are not going to argue with each other about <laughs> prominence and that kind of things. So we can start with Professor Ben Krum, who is from the Amsterdam, the Freie Universiteit Amsterdam, extensive research experience on the institutional organization of the EU and in particular on issues of democratic uh, representation arising in uh, that context. Professor Peter de Wilde will then speak. Professor Peter de Wilde is uh, Associate Professor in European Politics um, at Trondheim uh, University. He <coughs> focuses in his research very much on patterns of co contestation over European integration in the public sphere, its embedding within the broader globalization cleavage, and its implications for democracy in Europe. Then we have Professor Julia Sandri from the Catholic University in Lille, who is an expert on political parties, territorial politics, political behavior, and she has worked extensively on intra-party democracy, the crisis of democracy in Italy notably, and parliamentary uh, representation. Last but not least, not least at all, we have Professor Oliver Tribe, whose research focuses on the role of Eurosceptic political attitudes in European Parliament elections, party-based Euroscepticism, and on the impact of Eurosceptic political mobilization on EU-related attitudes and voting behavior. 
problems. So we are very happy with this impressive lineup. Again, as I said, we should all do a little collective timekeeping, but it's now my pleasure to invite the first panelist, Mr. Koss, um, to, to, to take the floor and to share her insights and to update us on the important dynamics that have taken place recently. Please. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Professor. Uh, I hope my microphone now is on. Thank you. So, yes, we are here today to uh, talk about, about uh, <coughs> a very interesting and uh, fascinating, I would say, topic. So please interrupt me if I exceed my 10 minutes. Um, we, are, we are here to discuss about and to, to, to find out and to learn <coughs> more about um, an initiative which is new and, uh, and strategic, I would say. But I would also ask myself whether this is really new <coughs> or whether this is an old uh, topic. If we see the extent and the amplitude of the initiative and the structure that uh, it's, uh, it's taking uh, a form. Yes, it is a new initiative. It will be an initiative that will keep us uh, busy for two years, probably more. Uh, <laughs> but if we look at the content of it, I think this is not a new topic. Uh, why I say that? Because in the last, uh, I would say, three to four years, we have been talking about the future of Europe extensively in many uh, configurations, uh, from many institutions, in many ways. I may very briefly remind what has been done so far. Uh, Parliament has issued two, well, three uh, interesting and important resolutions in 2017 two. Uh, the two resolutions that take the name from the rapporteurs, the Bresso Brock uh, resolution and the Verhofstadt uh, resolution. Uh, the first one is more, was more trying to um, uh, I would say uh, leverage on the unused potential of the treaties. The second one, the Verhofstadt, uh, was clearly uh, pushing towards uh, treaty changes. More recently, Parliament has published uh, uh, a resolution on the, the, the status of, of uh, the debate on the future of Europe in 2019. Now, the Commission, as we uh, and probably you know as well, has published a very interesting uh, white paper on the five modalities to work together in the future and how to advance, not so much uh, focused on policy but on how to work together. And uh, I cannot, of course, representing in this, uh, in this distinguished panel, representing the Parliament, I cannot overlook the um, very visible initiative <coughs> that Parliament took in 2018 and 2019 by inviting uh, heads of state or government to discuss and to lay down their vision for the future of Europe in, during the, the, the plenary in, uh, in, uh, in Strasbourg. This has given rise to a lot of discussions. Uh, 20 heads of state uh, government participated and it was very interesting to see how sometimes what divides is less than what unites uh, member states. Now, where are we now? After this little glimpse into the past, where are we now? Uh, we are now in a situation where <coughs> uh, President von der Leyen has promised to uh, to um, <coughs> carry on this uh, this uh, um, conference. Uh, Commissioner Schwitzer is responsible for that, together with uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Jourova and Shevkovic. But she is the we say in French we say the chef de file, so to say the leading commissioner on this. Um, the idea would be to gather as much as possible and to revive uh, the interest of citizens uh, towards and to, to, to make them owners of poli European politics and policies. Uh, but how to do that uh, from the Commission, we uh, don't know it yet officially. Of course, uh, through some linkages, we know what is the approach. What I would like to concentrate is the approach of um, the Parliament, because uh, the um, resolution that was, was adopted and was voted with a large majority last week was uh, pretty interesting. Parliament is clearly in favor of the uh, involvement of citizens. Uh, very, very, very strong focus and emphasis on that. Um, how? Uh, through uh, using a Greek uh, term, through citizens agora, meaning fora, where citizens can debate. <laughs> Actually, when I read it, uh, it was, uh, I mean, it's very detailed. The, res the resolution of Parliament is quite detailed on composition, on policy clusters, on the numbers of members of, uh, uh, of the conference. 
So it's really very much thought through and comes through uh, a work of brainstorming and of debating also within <coughs> the AFCO committee. AFCO committee has been dealing with this in, uh, the in the autumn, during the autumn meetings, and has produced uh, an opinion that afterwards went to part to president and which was taken into account uh, in the drafting of uh, the draft resolution that afterwards was, was approved um, in, in the last week's uh, plenary. But uh, a bit on the details. A bit on the details is that, um, as far as I see, uh, the parliament um, envisages to have sort of mini parliaments of citizens, like uh, uh, citizens agoras between 200 and 300 maximum uh, number, with citizens uh, from all the world, from all the world now, from all Europe, of course, and uh, um, and uh, ready to debate on uh, uh, policy thematic clusters. These clusters are basically the ones of the priority of, uh, of uh, President von der Leyen. Uh, but how to do that, it's, uh, it's <coughs> very interesting. They say uh, they would like that the policy clusters, the citizens participating in policy clusters are the same. So like mini committees per thematic uh, topic, uh, having citizens participating uh, European citizens participating <coughs> in the debate. Now, how this uh, uh, debate within citizens can be conveyed to the conference plenary, uh, this is another, uh, is another issue. So there is also a way to convey, uh, and Parliament envisages a way to convey this, uh, the outcome of the discussion between the citizens in, um, in the conference. It's, uh, um, as, a, as a, when I read it, I re reminded me, I reminded myself of what one member of uh, Parliament said that the, the focus should be to have citizens discussing together, not states and uh, um, leaders, new leaders discussing among themselves. Because this was the main, the main thing. On other uh, details, I would say the configuration of the conference, the composition of the conference, is a bit. Uh, heavier, uh, not heavier, but more numerous than what we had, for example, in the convention in 2002. Because here, Parliament <coughs> wants to have 135 members of uh, Parliament. Uh, in the convention, there were, I think, 16, or so much less. Um, uh, pa participation of national parliaments, participation of the Commission, three members, participation of Council, but, uh, and here it is specified, not at head of state level, but at ministerial level. So it is clear an exercise for uh, the Parliament, an exercise that should remain with its citizens, should be less, uh, say, more bottom up than, than, than the contrary. Um, so this is basically the, the, the position of, of Parliament. Now on the leadership there have been many discussions. I heard that um, here, I, thought, I heard that uh, there has been reached uh, uh, an agreement on the, the leader of, uh, of, of the conference. Apparently it should be uh, Kiefer Hofstadt. Perhaps if some of your, uh, of your um, guest wants to expand a bit more on that. But there has been, of course, the, the, <coughs> there have been a lot of discussions whether there should be the, um, the, the president of the AFCO committee, whether it should be the president of the parliament itself, or whether uh, there should be another <laughs> prominent European um, figure. Now, um, <coughs> apart from, from this, then perhaps I should conclude by saying that um, if, um, if I want to um, talk about challenges uh, and, uh, I would say, problematic points of, 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 this, uh, um, of this conference, I would perhaps borrow the uh, title of a uh, book of um, Charles Dickens by saying that Parliament has definitely great expectations on this, uh, on this exercise. One can see it clearly from the debate in the AFCO committee, from the debate in the plenary. Um, although many members have warned to be cautious about um, how to make it a meaningful exercise and not a marketing exercise, in the sense that many members uh, of parliament have uh, pointed out to the fact that we know already what citizens want. Do we really want and what is the use of another conference? So the use of another conference, I would say, would be for parliament a golden opportunity at this point to talk about the, some desiderata that Parliament um, would like to uh, discuss already sometime. And I'm talking about Spitzenkandidat, I'm talking about, I would 
translationalist parliament is a bit divided, it's not uh, univocal, uh, but for sure uh, the power of legislative initiative, uh, that is a topic that the parliament is, would be very eager to, to, to bring back. Uh, the, the council as second chamber. So these are more or less the topics that from an institutional perspective and of course policy uh, clusters, it's a different topic, but I'm talking about now institutional, uh, broad institutional horizontal um, aspects. These are the topics that um, probably parliament would be happy to discuss. So I invite all of you to follow this. And uh, on this uh, final note, I thank uh, Professor Vargas for uh, the opportunity to talk in this <coughs> very distinguished panel. Thank you very much. to look back a little bit and we have a very distinguished colleague from the Netherlands. Remember the founding member state that with a huge majority rejected the European constitutional treaty. Yeah, I remind people of their historical responsibility. Uh, and so Ben, maybe you can share with us also some lessons that we also can draw from the experience with the convention. Thank you. Thank you for being on this panel. Um, as I think the, the obvious starting point is, um, and that's also in the resolution of the, the uh, European Parliament, is that uh, Europe is not finished. And that uh, there are a number of obvious domains where before would be desirable. And, and one, of course, kind of one lightning rod in this, this uh, uh, evolution of how this conference has come on the agenda has been the speech and candidate process, where we feel that that has to be clarified and the procedure as it works obviously has not led to kind of consensual operation. That's a transnational list. Um, but of course there are broader issues. Uh, there's a foreign policy do uh, domain where there's a real sense that the Europe is still not ready for um, playing the role that it should role, uh, it should play. Um, there is uh, the, the Green New Deal, which is a big thing. Um, but at the same time remains now very much a, a thing about making money rather than efficient of what it makes mean for you. There is the big rule of law issue uh, that divides us. Um, and in the past, when we faced such big questions in Europe, um, we had a certain idea about how to deal with that. Uh, uh, we had treaty reform. So uh, there was a golden era of treaty reform somewhere between 1985 and 2009. We had five new treaties, uh, and we would uh, convene intergovernmental conferences. Um, we would make a new treaty, there would be one or two member states who would hold a referendum on it, and if they didn't give the right answer, they would have a second referendum, and we would pass the treaty. Um, and then in the last uh, treaty, uh, we revised it somewhat, and we said, well, if we really have big treaty reform, it has to be a more open process, and we've had this convention once, and for future treaty reforms, we have to have, uh, 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 again, a convention, and all that. Um, but apparently, we don't know how to do reform in Europe anymore. Uh, we, are, we find ourselves being very divided. We don't believe in our ability to find a consensus. Uh, we don't, uh, we are, there's a sense, I guess, of polarization, fragmentation. We are dealing with 27 member states, or for now even 28 still, but uh, that should be 27 by the 1st of February. And also, we are afraid of the people. We are afraid, we're so afraid of the people that we rather have them do our, take our responsibilities than to take them on our own. And much of that is due indeed to the trauma of the, of the Constitution Treaty um, and of the Convention. Um, so, so, I mean, of course, one response that the Conference on the Future of Europe is getting is that let's not have treaty reform, because treaty reform means referendums, referendums means uh, 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 facing the people. Um, and uh, it means probably that they will not like what we do and they will reject it. And in this climate and social media, and you know what happened to Brexit, and we're also afraid of it. Um, and as uh, we're so traumatized and so afraid of that, that we rather step back and say, well, we don't know what this, it has to be bottom up, open. We don't want to have a predetermined outcome. Uh, we don't want to have a predetermined agenda. Uh, so we list some topics, but, but it should be open. And but what is the reason that we think that if we invite <coughs> several hundred citizens in a range of bodies, that, will, that there will be a consensus emerging from that. And what is, and even if, and I think 
what we know, of course, about these citizen forums is that they, they actually are quite aggressive in forcing an internal consensus. Um, the bigger case is, what's the credibility outside? Why would 450 uh, uh, million Europeans say, oh, there are 200 to 300 people randomly selected with well-balanced criteria in gender, ethnicity, nationality, um, and they've come to a consensus, so let's buy that. Um, who are they? Who do they represent? How have they been authorized? Um, so nothing is that we, but we know about citizens <coughs> for that they are very nicely internally, but um, in the end somebody has to take responsibility on the outside. And that's I think where politicians come in again. So I think, uh, going back to the convention, <coughs> I was there, I was here in Brussels when it, when it went, I was back in Amsterdam and in the Netherlands, uh, when, and, and, and actually uh, uh, acting as an expert in, 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 in very many local discussions about uh, the constitutional treaty and pe people preparing for the referendum and uh, and of course for the for the Dutch it has been a big trauma. Uh, I was also involved in a, in a report of the scientific council of the Dutch government uh, uh, about how uh, what lessons we should draw. Uh, but maybe the biggest mistake was not so much the convention. The convention was in a way incredible. It did force a consensus. Uh, it did produce a, a, a document that went far beyond expectations. Um, what was the disaster? Was not the convention itself, not the treaty case itself. I think it was the way that politicians dealt with once they encountered that not all citizens liked it. Um, how do you deal with political defeat? How do you deal with political opposition? It starts actually when you go out of a proposal and you find yes, there's still criticism. Then you start to discuss and then you revise and amend. And the honorable thing to do, and maybe that's easy for me to say as an, as an academic, would, would have been for the, for the Dutch government to have a Lisbon Treaty and say, well, we've got rid of the whole constitutional thing, do you like it better now? And to have a second referendum. There's no harm in second referendums. I mean, democracy is an open process and you go back. Um, and I actually think that what happened in Ireland on the Lisbon Treaty was pretty honorable. They had a defeat and then they went back, they got uh, 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 a declaration from the European Council. It's one reason why we still now have uh, 20, uh, 27 uh, uh, commissioners, uh, where I think, which is a problem, but it's a concession that we made, particularly to the Irish. Um, and then they went back, and you can say, well, it, you can be cynical about it. Um, they were forced, the, the Irish were forced to uh, vote yes, but they did vote yes. And I also think that most people are not your average Twitter trolls, they are actually quite reasonable. And if you explain like, hey, we're in this together, we have to compromise, then you, you go back. But where it starts is actually that as politicians you take a stand, mm -hmm. rather than saying, we don't want to determine anything on, about the outcome from the beforehand. We don't want to take a stand. We don't have any, any ideas. We go to the citizens. And I think if you take citizens seriously, you bring them proposals. You say, we have a number of ideas. And now you shoot. And, and indeed, you come to those citizens who are with ideas, because you're a politician. And you offer them alternatives. And you take defeat sometimes, and you revise, and you reconsider, and you come back. But you don't hide behind bottom-up, open, open, undetermined, um, and infinite process. Because garbage in, garbage out, nothing in, nothing out. Um, and I think the, the way that, that, in the way everyone now is taking their hands off the, uh, the conference and saying, well, the people have to do it. Um, well, the people are probably more divided even than we are. And if nobody takes the lead, then nobody will, nothing will come out of it. Great. Great stuff. I'm sure we will debate all of that. But now we go to Peter de Wilde. And Peter, uh, in fact, is also in touch, if I may still say that, Peter. So there's continuity between the speakers. But Peter is working in Norway. And as I said, he's working on contestation uh, in European politics, but especially in the linkage between uh, Europe and uh, globalization. <coughs> so, Peter, enlighten us. Thank you. Um, my main argument for today is going to be that I hope that this will be a conference on the future of Europe. My fear is that it will be a conference on the future of EU institutions, which is a rather different thing. I'm saying this because I think the chances and the dangers that we face for democracy lie in Europe more generally and not so much in the EU institutions. I'm not saying that EU institutions are perfect and there's not enough room for improvement. I'm just saying that problems elsewhere are bigger and opportunities elsewhere are also bigger. Um, 
Where? Well, the main problem that I see uh, for democracy in Europe in the future is societal polarization. What does that mean? It means our societies, our peoples are increasingly split on some key divisive issues. Think immigration, think EU membership, think climate change, think free trade. <coughs> These are all issues that have something to do with globalization, with the ease of societal interaction across borders. Shall we allow foreigners to enter our country or shall we close the borders? Shall we collaborate with other peoples to determine decisions together in the European institutional framework? Or are we trying to isolate ourselves into some kind of national sovereignty? Shall we freely trade? Shall we collaborate on combating our probably most pressing um, danger at the time, uh, drastic climate change? Or do we each and hide behind our own country borders and say environmental issues is something to be decided at the national level and we don't want <coughs> foreigners to influence whether we can uh, emit CO2 or not. And all that aligns and it's driving us apart. It's driving us apart because uh, it is underpinned very much by education. Higher educated people tend to be on this cosmopolitan side in favor of openness, in favor of international collaboration, lower educated people tend to be on the so-called communitarian side, in favor of closure, in favor of national sovereignty. And we don't meet anymore. I bet 95% of these people here are higher educated. I bet 95% of us here are in favor of EU membership, global combating climate change, reasonably open to immigration, and reasonably favorable to free trade deals. But that's not representative of our European <coughs> societies. Where are the communitarians? They're not in this room. And we don't meet anymore. We don't meet in university. Uh, we read different newspapers or different websites. We marry somebody from our own group. It's like a return, and now I call on my Dutch history, to pillarized society that we in the Netherlands know very well. You know, the Catholics have their own Catholic newspaper, Catholic church, Catholic uh, football club, etc., etc., never meets anybody from the Protestant side. Now we have this uh, in a globalization cleavage. So, that problem is not something located at EU institutions. Uh, but there is something that we can do. And I have three suggestions. Suggestion number first, uh, number one, uh, make overarching coalitions on issues that align on this cleavage, this division, uh, yet where there are more or less majorities on opposing side. And I'm particularly seeing some promise in collaboration between Greens and Conservatives. Uh, a policy or a government program that combines uh, ambitious climate change goals with stringent <laughs> anti-immigration policy. That's the way of speaking to both sides, of incorporating something that each of these two major groups cares about. And we see it at the European level, the, the Commission is pushing this, we see it in Austria, and I think there's a potential in this. And if we can come back to the conference, that would mean that um, it is important to open up opportunities for policy change on these issues, that new commissions and new EU leaders can actually change something in the sense of openness of our societies, open it further, close it down, so that we can respond to uh, citizen demands there. Second uh, possible solution is push both sides to relate to commonly held values. We all care about justice. We all care about equality. We all care about solidarity, freedom, democracy. How can we relate our policy preferences to these common values? Can we push <coughs> the anti-immigrationists to tell us, OK, so you want to close down borders and restrict immigration. How is that going to help us create a more just society? How is it going to further equality? How is it going to generate increased solidarity? And the same challenge for our cosmopolitan friends 
okay, you want a more ambitious climate change policy, how is that going to bring a more just society? How is it going to further equality? How is it going to generate individual freedom? Um, third, I think um, uh, there's great merit in picking up your uh, Greek um, uh, reference to the Agoras uh, in uh, taking some lessons learned uh, and lost and forgotten again in democratic theory from ancient Athens, from uh, ancient Florence, or less ancient Renaissance Florence and Venice, namely lottery. This is now something uh, planned for this, uh, or thought about for this Agora system, randomly hold a lottery among EU citizens and involve them for a period of time in actual uh, policy making. Now on the conference, but I think that should be a more permanent uh, uh, feature. So here, I guess I disagree with Ben Kuhn um, in the sense that one of the challenges to overcome, related very much to this new division that I've sketched, is that we have politicians and we have citizens, but you apparently cannot be both, which I find a rather strange thing. Um, so now we're talking about let's involve the citizens. Yeah, but all these people in the parliament, in the commission, they're also citizens. Why is this division so clear, so uh, stretched? If we increase participation in regular governance through something like lottery, and then you can at least to some extent uh, mitigate this distinction. So that was my main message. Let's hope for a conference on the future of Europe rather than EU institutions. Why? Because of societal division and three routes uh, uh, to mitigate that is build overarching coalitions, and speak to commonly held values, and think about increasing lottery as a selection mechanism. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. Now we turn to Professor Julia Sandri, who, as I said, uh, has been studying uh, party uh, democracy and parliamentary representation, but she, I understand that she will mainly focus on rebuilding trust with citizens. So please, Julia. Thank you. Uh, so I don't know whether this uh, conference is necessary to be held now for reforming the treaties or adopting new policies, but what is certain is that now is the moment to use this opportunity to strengthen trust of EU citizens in the EU project for uh, making them feel that they have a say in how European governance is actually working and will be working in the future. And for discussing that, I would like to raise three main points, three main challenges that the conference is going to be facing. And uh, that must be paid attention for uh, in order to produce effective outcomes. Well, the first, um, the first issue is that the conference will be raising expectations that are going to be difficult to match in terms of outputs that are going to be um, um, easily or uh, uh, implemented or uh, uh, applicable in, in real life in, in following discussion and uh, policy measures. Uh, so the how risk is to end up uh, obtaining actually the opposite uh, outcome than uh, the one the conference is pursuing, meaning further eroding trust of European citizens in the uh, in the EU project. So, uh, given that the um, the conference is certain to be raising great expectations, as uh, our, our colleague said before, uh, well. The point is that the conference must be capable to deliver. So the design of the conference must be thought in a way that it will be certain to allow for producing effective uh, outcomes, be them uh, a treaty uh, a reform or new policies or uh, institutional reforms or whatever outcomes comes out of the conference, it might be something that is easily identified by citizens, uh, that uh, is effectively communicated to citizens, and that is feasible in the short to uh, medium term. Um, the second point I would like to make here today is that beyond the design of the conference, and uh, uh, other colleagues already uh, underline this point, 
it's crucial that this is used as an opportunity to strengthen uh, practices of democracy at uh, Europe level. And there are certainly high risks also uh, of transforming the conference in a top-down experiment rather than a real bottom-up uh, participatory moment. And if it's true that the resolution by the parliament and the leaked document by the commission seems to be stepping up the game in uh, identifying the appropriate uh, measure and instruments uh, for really involving citizens in the conference and in uh, European governance uh, more generally, <coughs> we need to pay attention to uh, uh, key measures that must be used for actually delivering on this point. Well, so the proposal of establishing um, youth or citizens' agoras is particularly relevant, and it seems that there's some level of coordination or agreement between uh, different institutions in, in, in the last proposal that have been presented. But um, in order to identify uh, the most effective way for carrying out these uh, specific um, um, uh, venues for participatory or deliberative democracy, for really involving citizens, I think uh, we, might do, we might need to pay attention to two points. Uh, first of all, uh, we might need to maybe do together a little benchmarking exercise for identifying the best, practi best practices of the many events of this type that have already taken place, both at European level, uh, with the citizens' dialogue that have been going on now for more than four years, and at national level, um, we have examples of uh, deliberative uh, venues that have been successful uh, in Ireland, in France, in Belgium. Um, so the idea is to look at really the technical expertise and the technical measures that have been already implemented in reality and to try to learn from them in order to make those youth and citizen agoras effective. Um, the other point regarding to uh, the way for best implementation of uh, the uh, implementation, uh, sorry, of involvement of citizens is also um, to look at to what extent um, citizens will be able not only to participate uh, in the conference actively, to be involved in a discussion, maybe even uh, report to the plenary sessions, but also to influence the agenda setting of the conference. Because most of the issues that are going to be discussed in the conference are more or less already set. Uh, and that, of course, uh, is needed uh, for setting up the conference. But what will really make the difference with the convention, even though I see a student there, so uh, I might not be uh, as um, uh, a good observer of the past than the new, but still, um, what might be the real difference from past experience is to allow citizens to receive enough information and to be allowed to really uh, shape the list of issues that are going to be discussed, so to work on the agenda setting of the conference and not only on uh, uh, shaping outcomes, which of course is crucial. And the last point, therefore, is to make sure that the conference will give, uh, will set up effective measure for conveying the outcomes of those youth and citizens agora into the workings of the plenary sessions and uh, the final documents and decisions that are going to be taken uh, by the conference. Something, some measures that are somehow official, formal, binding, that will really give the citizens the feeling that they finally have a say on how Europe is going to be reformed. Thank you. So last but not least, Professor Oliver Tribe, who will focus on the likelihoods, or less likelihood or more, of gaining popular or parliamentary approval of whatever reforms the conference will come up with. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Um, now, let me first say that, that I really like the initiative of having such a conference. I think uh, we all agree that there is a lot to be reformed in the EU. I mean, we might have very different views on what is the most pressing thing and what uh, the direction will be, but I think it's really good to, to start a discussion and also start a relatively open discussion without a really pre-structured um, agenda. Now, um, really my, my uh, point that I want to raise is really wh whatever, I mean, how are we going to make that work, whatever comes out of this process? Um, mm -hmm. So it's really about the popular uh, acceptance of uh, reforms that might um, result from this uh, conference. Um, now, as it happens, uh, in the context of our uh, ReConnect project, there is going to be uh, a big data collection exercise uh, taking place in uh, this spring, uh, where we try to find out what citizens uh, um, what reform preferences, what views uh, citizens have about reforming the EU. So we might be a bit wiser uh, towards the end of uh, this year, um, but we don't have the data yet, so we will have to uh, work on the assumption, um, or work on the basis of the information that we have. Now my point is, we know that there are a lot of Eurosceptics uh, in Europe, uh, almost in all countries, represented in all parliaments, uh, strongly represented in the European Parliament, um, and also ab about a third of all European citizens are deeply skeptical about the current EU, about deepening integration, uh, and things like that. So what is the conference um, going to offer to these people, and I think it will be important to have something to offer for these people and for these parties um, because otherwise I think uh, ratification of whatever or even acceptance of some of the um, uh, non-constitutional reforms that might come out of that uh, will be hard to achieve. Um, and I think I kind of start from a similar po um, uh, starting point than uh, Peter de Wilde. Uh, so we, we have these Eurosceptics who, who basically don't want to open uh, their societies, uh, etc. But I somehow also disagree with, uh, with what he said, because I think that Eurosceptics are not only against opening or closing societies, but they really they stick to the nation state. They, they talk about where should we implement which reforms? So even if you promise them uh, a restrictive European migration policy, uh, they might say, no, we don't want the EU to regulate migration in the first place. We want to do that on our own in our nation state. So it's this, uh, it's this contestation between uh, where to make decisions, where to implement decisions, I think that is at the heart of Euroscepticism. So it's some sort of anti-centralization movement. So people uh, who are skeptical about the EU have the feeling that too much is being decided at the European level, too many powers have been uh, transferred to Brussels and they want to counter that. So it's really about the, 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 the allocation of decision-making uh, powers uh, uh, between the European level and the national level. So um, I think the conference will have to think about uh, also offering something meaningful uh, uh, to people who think uh, European integration has already gone too far. And it, I think it's not enough to, to offer them certain EU policies. I think it would also make sense to uh, talk about um, maybe leaving certain things to the discretion of member states, maybe even give, giving back some of the powers that have been transferred uh, to the European level. So I think that, in my uh, view, um, is necessary to gain uh, acceptance for for, for ref, uh, reforms that are going to come out of this. Uh, and it's definitely so, and we will see a, a similar um, 
picture as after the constitutional uh, convention, there will be referendums. Ireland is uh, constitutionally forced to have a referendum and there will be others. I'm pretty sure that many governments uh, will not want to uh, ratify uh, the reforms that come out of this without uh, referendums. So it's, it's a hot topic. You don't want to touch it. Give it to the people. Um, so uh, they will, there will be referendums. And if you have Eurosceptic parties, they are going to rally against that. And so uh, we better make sure that there is something in for these um, parties and people. Um, so um, how could we do that? Um, I think I have um, three or maybe four uh, uh, ideas. Um, now, first of all, I think we should be braced for failure. It, sh it, sh it should be an open process, and we should always also be open to the idea that we conclude that this is not going anywhere. So having a debate for several months or maybe even one or two years, in the end we find out, well, maybe the status quo is better than any alternative that we can't agree on. So maybe just stick to it. Uh, that, that could be one, uh, one, one option. Um, but if you want to reform, if you want to deepen uh, uh, integration somewhere, I think you will really have to talk to people who are against that and uh, kind of find something um, that they could uh, use. And I really think it's about giving back powers to the nation state on salient topics. So if you want to do something on foreign policy, you will have to think about other things that you m don't want to do anymore at the European level, right? So I, I think there, there needs to be a trade-off, and this needs to be made uh, explicit, uh, so that you really can go and uh, sell this to Eurosceptics uh, in the European Parliament, in national parliaments, in governments um, in Europe. Um, um, I think you could, of course, also uh, offer more um, uh, involvement of national parliaments. So this is another uh, route, I think. So the, the criticism of Eurosceptics is always, you know, this is all far removed from our uh, national parliaments, un undemocratic, etc. So why not really think about more involvement of national parliaments in the process of EU policy making? maybe also strengthen um, a subsidiarity control mechanism. We have a, a mechanism, but it's kind of cumbersome, uh, etc. so why not strengthen that? So I'm, I'm really thinking about uh, finding a balance uh, here. Um, and a uh, final point, uh, maybe really avoid treaty change altogether. I think that could at least be a, a rather um, uh, rather uh, a realistic uh, option, because it's rather likely that <coughs> treaty uh, reform will fail uh, in one of the 27 uh, member states. So, and that would be the I think that would be uh, an opportunity to just talk about policy priorities. Really, what should the EU do? But then again, also, what should it maybe not do? Uh, should it maybe take less of a heavy hand in whatever competition policy or internal market, uh, market opening, things like that, uh, um, and, and, and these things. So, so I, have, I have a feeling that most elites at the European level always talk about what can we do better, how can we do more at the European level. I think it would make sense to also think about doing less uh, and doing maybe this, the, 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 the what's left maybe a bit better so far. Thank you. Thank you. I was first thinking of having an uh, intra-panel debate, but I'm just dropping the idea and we're going to immediately turn to you and if you want to have debates among yourselves, you can weave that into your uh, reactions to the, the audience. So we'll, we'll create a whole uh, Agora here, and we're going to kindly ask you, but please identify yourself 
and then uh, try to be yeah, concise and we also try to involve as many as possible. I do not know where to start, but there's somebody uh, walking around with a microphone. Okay, um, why don't you start in the back? So we start with the back benches and then we, we come to the front. Huh? Thank you. Matt Trump from the Bingham Center, one of the consortium partners. Um, thanks to uh, all the panelists. Um, I've got two questions. The first one is um, about this idea of agoras. To what extent do you think there's a risk that they will be politicized or manipulated to some extent at the local level within each of the countries? I mean, I can think of certain places where, I don't know if this, uh, as I think was made clear, we don't know how it's going to be organized just yet, but I can imagine if it goes through some trade unions, some of the trade unions are going to be politicized. You know, in some way or form, there may be some government uh, levers, if you will, that are going to be pulling the strings. And so, therefore, it might, in some ways, skew the discussion, if you will. Um, do, you, do you share that concern? Um, that's the first question. And the second one, I guess I just wanted to um, go back to what Oliver uh, was saying there towards the end, if you don't mind me asking. Um, could you provide maybe some examples of how you'd sort of bring power back to the member states? What kind of powers would you give back to the member states? Because, I mean, we're talking about, you know, Green New Deal, we're talking about all these things. Um, you know, we know that EU is a very skewed platform, a lot of inequalities between member states. So, to some extent, could that also amplify those inequalities that already exist? Thank you. Thank you. We're going to collect a couple of questions. And now, uh, for fairness sake, we return to the front <laughs> rows here. Can you please quickly we come back to you in the, in the back? Thank you. My name is Patrick Dubicor, representing Caritas Europa. Um, first, about uh, citizens' participation, I just want to remember that when the, there was these talks about changing constitutional treaty, citizens' participation had a key role and succeeded in bringing forward the idea of the social dimension of the European Union, which would have been left away without the citizen dimension. My question is, uh, thank you for all your uh, comments and uh, ideas, but nobody uh, talked about the fate of the Eurozone uh, inside the European Union. Do you think that could be uh, an issue to be uh, addressed uh, at this occasion? Okay, thank you. Uh, we continue in the proximity of the mics. Linda, somebody there? And then we turn back to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dima. I work at the United Nations Human Rights Office here in Brussels. Um, my question, well, first of all, thank you very much. It's a very interesting uh, debate that's pushing the discussion a bit further. Uh, in the discussions up until now, we've noticed the term human rights hasn't really featured uh, at all in, from what I see from what's coming from the Parliament or the Council or the Commission or even today's panel. Uh, even though we know that at the source of a lot of discontent with Europe and the European project, sometimes the human rights violations lie at the heart of that. And we can also find some of the mechanisms to deal with a lot of the, a lot of the issues can be found in a rights-based approach. So my question to the panel is, well, actually I have two questions. Firstly, do you think this omission is deliberate? And secondly, if it is or it isn't, let's say it isn't deliberate, what do you think can be done to increase awareness of the link between this push for greater democracy and, and rule of law protection and human rights. Thanks. Thank you. Here in the front, please. Yes, uh, good afternoon. My name is Hans Stotzer. I work for Fisco Not Europe. Um, and my question was we talked a lot about the uh, European Parliament and, and Commission positions. Uh, but not so much about uh, the Council position, uh, which is also upcoming. And we've seen in December that the German-French non-paper has received a very cold shower. And what do you think uh, the influence of uh, maybe some obstruction in the Council could have on the conference and whether uh, the outcome of the conference and the European Parliament's pledge to um, come forward with, uh, with uh, proposals uh, could force the Council to um, to, uh, to adopt the, the changes proposed in the conference. Thank you. Maybe a last question and then we'll return to the panel. Somebody from that side of the audience. So whoever reaches the mic first. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Sebastian Toto from the Young European Federalist. Uh, first of all, uh, I wanted to thank all the speakers also for offering different perspectives. Uh, expectedly, I do not agree with some of them. And we will not agree with what I have to say, <laughs> I'll be very sure. There's two points. One is on the involvement of citizens. This can mean many things. 
because citizens' participation can happen in the form of autonomous citizens' organizations, through political parties, through trade unions, through civil society organizations. And this is a role we, civil society as a whole, has continuously in pushing for certain items on the policy agenda. <coughs> and then there's the issue of the Agora and what, more specifically, and how this, the citizens feed into the conference and into the decision makers. Uh, and the experience that Professor Sandri was mentioning isn't really on citizens taking the decisions and replacing representative democracy, but complementing it. It's in helping setting the agenda and in, it's offering a feedback loop that in a sense forces politicians and decision makers to test run the ideas they have before they actually put them to referendum. So do you see this process uh, as helpful for the conference and for its outcomes or not? And then secondly, uh, and I'll close soon, I promise, um, I would say that the traditional division on Europe is between skeptics and federalists, to simplify very much, the ones who do not like the EU and want to destroy it completely, or you know, different levels on the spectrum, and the ones who want to create a European super state, which is the usual misunderstanding of what federalism is about. Federalism is actually not that, it's about subsidiarity, it means we centralize only what we need to centralize, macroeconomic civilization is a classic, to go back to Eurozone, whereas we go back to as close as possible to citizens, when we can, when that action can be effective. And this is the distribution of power. And obviously my assessment is that the EU right now is not working and the current treaty framework is not working because we lost two things. One is the purpose of what the EU was about, which is through the coaling of coal and steel back in the day, the realization of the foundations of the European Federation for the preservation of peace. There is no sense of purpose anymore. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be that. I think that is the best purpose, but like, how does that come into play? I mean, there is no purpose. I, I hear no vision, even in the discussion on the future of Europe. I hear no vision and no deep, ground-breaking idea of why we have Europe. Where is that? And you know, what is the contribution of academia to that also? Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, well, federalists usually have yeah. <laughs> 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 Let's yes, we turn to the panel now. We start with the first speaker. Yes, I think uh, I could um, catch two or three questions that, uh, to which I can contribute. Uh, the first on the politici politicized uh, agoras, politicization of agoras. Um, I, I don't have a, a very strong opinion on that, uh, apart from saying that, the, I mean, first of all, we, are, we don't know whether we will have agoras. That is just a proposal of uh, the parliament. I just want to uh, be clear on that. Uh, actually, if I may open a little uh, bracket, uh, uh, um, for me it's interesting to see what was the proposal, the proposal at least the statement of the European Council uh, in December that you mentioned uh, in your uh, opening address. Uh, on 12th of uh, December, the Council has referred to the Council, the, to the Conference on the Future of Europe, and has said that it wishes that the, it, it, is, it follows the um, strategic agenda that was approved in, in June, and that was it. And referred and trusted the Council to uh, discuss about it, and Council, as uh, Commissioner Suiza said uh, last, in last week's plenary, we'll discuss, uh, we'll discuss it at the General Affairs Council at the end of this month, so the 28th of, uh, of January. So we don't have the position of Council. We have the position of Parliament, which is along the lines uh, of what I said before, and we have the position of the Commission, which I did not expand on it before because I didn't want to invade the time of other uh, colleagues, panelists, but the position of uh, the Commission is uh, very balanced, I would say. On the one hand, you have Parliament pushes for agoras, for big parliaments, uh, with the representatives of uh, citizens uh, of, um, of member states on a proportionality basis, so really like very a, a small little parliament, I would say, and commission that says, well, we should build on what exists already in terms of networks, in, in terms of uh, platforms where citizens can uh, uh, express their opinions. So we have a, a, a more balance, I would say, pulling back the Commission. Uh, the Commission does not envisage uh, fora, uh, envisages, I would say, a situation where the mm, working groups of uh, the conference will hear the citizens, whereas Parliament sees it the other way around, where, where 
the, the, the fora of the agoras of citizens will fit in into the conference. So it's a, it's a different uh, perspective, I'd say. What will come out, we don't know, because um, because now, after a council will give its own vision and design of the conference, the three institutions will sit down together and will agree on a joint declaration how will be the setup of the conference. So, on the politics, so coming back now, this was just uh, to finish a bit on, on the organizational side. So, to come back on the politicization, whether yes or no, I don't know, because uh, in the parliament's vision, the, the, the agoras will be random, the citizens will be randomly selected. So whether this, and I come back to uh, uh, one of my colleagues before who made the point, are these representatives of the citizens at all? Is that a random selection representative? I, I don't know. So in, in that sense, how you can politicize it? I mean, can you politicize? For me, as a, uh, as a citizen, because I'm, uh, I work for parliament, but I'm also a citizen and I understand the value of, of this exercise, for me it makes sense to have also those who disagree and who are skeptical to be part of it. If a random selection does not represent or does not give voice to them, can be random as much as you want, but for me it does not uh, um, reach the scope to have all voices heard, because that was the mantra of Commissioner von der Leyen, to have all voices heard and to have everyone who is on this board, on, on this union, to have their say. So I hope I, I reply to the, 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 the person who made the question before. On uh, the council position, I think I said something. I don't know uh, the internal uh, workings, I mean, the internal negotiating and, and um, uh, you know, play games of council, but I can say that uh, from what I read of the council position, citizens are not so much the center. Uh, and I would expect that council will somehow overlook that aspect, although I can't say that, uh, you know, but that is my feeling, my belly feeling. Um, on the citizens' participation as a sounding board, um, indeed, I think, uh, the, uh, I think I tried to highlight a bit the two different approaches, and uh, we will see which one of the two, because as having as a sounding board, probably it's more the commission proposal, the commission uh, uh, approach to have workings and then to have the citizens uh, uh, having, uh, you know, at, at least is how I see it. And then the, the Parliament sees it more uh, in a more uh, a, a more participation of, of citizens in terms of not deliberation but conveying of the message. Where the count, the Commission, in my opinion, as I read the uh, leaked uh, Commission uh, communication, it's more okay. We are discussing. Let's hear the, count, the the citizens what they have to say and let's take into account what they say. So it's more a sounding more approach. That is my. Thank you very much. We go to Ben. Yes. Um, I think the first point is, is picking up also a bit on the colleagues, and we don't necessarily agree on everything. And one thing I think I want to highlight is that there are many reasons to be dissatisfied with Europe and with the European Union as it stands. Many different reasons. I think even in the UK, we know that, of course, many people dislike the European integration. But again, it was a very uh, uh, diverse, uh, motley uh, crew of different opponents with different arguments. Um, and I think, uh, in that sense, I think also to my colleagues, it's, it's really, we have to be very careful to homogenize them out there. Think, uh, if we think of ourselves as being the among the 95% that are highly educated and, and, and internationalists, and then there is this other third of the world that we don't meet, uh, and they are there and they are nationalists. No, they are not their own nationalists. Um, they have very diverse ob objectives, and some actually, I think, make a lot of sense, and I can sympathize with. So, um, so of course, we have to pattern and structure, but I think also it's, it's all about recognizing the diversity of resentments and, and dissatisfaction rather than, um, and, and also, I mean, that's where respect starts also. Then you start to listen and say, well, okay, so how can we address that? And then I guess if there's a lot of different building blocks that you have to assemble rather than that there's one golden bullet. And I think that's what democracy is about. Um, so th then the question I think is really about sequencing, about how, and I think you also just uh, addressed that to me, how do you get this conversation going? How do you complement the political responsibility with the involvement of citizens? I think you take citizens seriously by talking to them as well, by putting something to them, and then having them respond. And I think that's where, where we went wrong in the past often, that when we get pushed back, in particularly in the uh, current political climate, we kind of broke down and uh, opt out. But actually, that's where the, the, the conversation starts. So in that sense, I actually do have some sympathy for the Commission's proposal, where um, you start with proposals, and then, indeed, 
you try them out, you test them. Uh, I think if we just leave it to the citizens to have them now up front, then, I mean, well, who know, why would the citizens have a united force anywhere, anyway? And then um, it's quite likely indeed that we are uh, creating uh, uh, great expectations that will be let down because we won't be able to respond to everything that citizens come up if we just ask them to, 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 to shout. Now, I think what's crucial here, and that's also about the hijacking of, of Agora, for instance, is that there's a collective ownership of the process. And in that sense, I'm actually quite skeptical of kind of hiving off the different Agoras and have every county have their own Agora. I think what we really have is a collective center where we really have to have that 20 conversation between 27 and where there's a focus. And you can only, the best protection against hijacking is publicity. But if there's kind of 27 Agoras going on, I'm not going to watch what's going on in Bulgaria or Luxembourg. Uh, I, I probably watch what's going on in the Netherlands and in Germany. Um, but, uh, and that's a recipe that indeed uh, some of the Agoras will be kind of sounding boards or, or a little group sync, cliquish. Uh, uh, so we need not too many Agoras. Uh, and we have to own them collectively. And that's of course where the council becomes crucial. Um, yes, we need the council to be deeply involved. And I think actually um, the way that already the commission has delegated responsibility and the, the chair to uh, the European Parliament is actually a, a way of disowning it. I mean, our governments have to be fully committed to it. And the question is, how do we get them on board into this process? Um, well, the convention learned, of course, or taught us that once things get their own momentum, and suddenly you find foreign ministers jumping in and saying, oh boy, this may get serious and, and, and we better get in. So, so one thing is indeed to rely on the process and to, to, to see whether it, it will get a self-sustaining momentum. And of course, a lot of the fear is that we have to get that momentum out of it right now. The other thing is actually to put things on the agenda that do matter. And some things simply have to be uh, uh, resolved. And some things the uh, governments don't want to be resolved without them. I mean, they, they, they're probably happy to, to talk about to have Agoras discuss foreign policy and Europe as a foreign actor uh, because they don't expect it to come up with, with drastic solutions. But, but, but there is, and the, I'm sorry, that's also institutional question, but also the speech and process will need the involvement of the council. There's no solution to the, um, so once that's firmly there on the agenda, they will be involved. And that's also, I think, part of the strategy of to separate those two issues, to say, well, we have an institutional track where you do more kind of inside Brussels, and then we have a public track where they can discuss policies. Um, but maybe we have to make sure that we link those strategically to make sure that governments are fully involved. Because, again, it's about ownership. And if I, my government owns this process, then as a citizen, I think um, it will also help to involve my uh, engagement. Thank you. Peter. Thanks, Albert. I'll be very brief and uh, just pick up the human rights question. Um, the challenge with human rights is that it increasingly resonates with the division that I have sketched that it is the cosmopolitans who are in favor of this and communitarians critical of. And there's two parts in human rights that uh, enable this resonance. First, uh, there's an inherent individualism, uh, a moral starting point from the individual human being, which easily creates also an understanding of people from other countries and other places in the world, which the cosmopolitans share and the communitarians don't. And the second thing is it's uh, institutionalized <coughs> in the UN Declaration on Human Rights, which is a supranational institution uh, imposing a kind of uh, governance structure rule set on uh, individual communities. So that's why communitarians easily oppose this, and it's also why this division between cosmopolitans and communitarians is so fundamental. It's not just a disagreement on how much money we should spend on education which is something where you can find a compromise. No, it's much more, much more fundamental. So I would not um, uh, push the human rights agenda so much in treaty change because it's in inevitably going to alienate the communitarians. Okay. And in any event, the treaty is already littered with human rights language since Lisbon, but that's yeah. another debate. Okay, <coughs> okay. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the questions. I'll also pick one or two aspects of my answer to, to, to some of them at the same time, I think. Um, well, uh, in particular, talking about the Agoras, I think that um, some of the doubts or issues we are discussing here are also deriving from the fact that some of the language that is used in the proposal formal proposal so far uh, uh, presented to the public by European institutions is still broadly in their institutional or using 
um, an incremental approach uh, to the proposals that have been done uh, in the past for in, in, in involving citizens. And um, in, in that sense, I think there's a bit of, um, let's say, um, lack of uh, clarity on whether the type of instruments that are going to be used are more deliberative for hearing what people have to say and then we might take that or not into account or uh, participatory democracy instruments for really making citizens part of both the agenda setting and decision making. So both of non-decision making and then decision making. And um, my, my point is that uh, in order to ensure a proper feedback loop and really for streamlining, directing the outcomes of those agoras or participatory uh, venues into uh, the, the, the outcomes of the conference, uh, uh, of course there must be some kind of uh, mechanism for uh, formally taking them uh, into account. Uh, so for making those venues more participatory than uh, than deliberative uh, on the one hand. And on the other hand, I think the point is that um, those kind of exercise in participatory or deliberative democracy, depending on what's decided in the end, are not necessarily uh, mutually exclusive uh, with uh, the existing form of representative democracy. So one option would be, for example, that those agoras, uh, or whatever they will be called in the end, uh, will produce uh, different uh, documents on different visions for Europe, uh, one, two, three different alternative visions. Uh, that's what also uh, uh, more traditional political organizations do to aggregate preferences into something that then is presented to the broader public for broader debate. And one of my suggestions uh, would be to link, to find a way to link the outcomes of the conference to the 2024 uh, elections uh, uh, campaign debate to fit the outcome of the conference into the uh, electoral campaign uh, and to try a way, find a way to organize the debate by traditional uh, political organization and, and parties in particular. Thank you. Oliver. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I will just pick up on the question that was uh, directed directly towards me about which powers might be transferred back to the to the national level. I mean, basically, it's not for me to decide that. It's, uh, it, I mean, I, that's why I said in the beginning, I, I like the idea of debating, and the outcome of a debate should be open, and if something comes up, then of course uh, the question is, that does that make sense, or does it not make sense? Um, but, uh, but I think, I mean, like, we are in a kind of federal system, uh, and so there are more, like, functional uh, ways of uh, allocating certain uh, um, governing powers at different levels. Um, uh, but I think, I mean, if you look at the EU, uh, I think several areas are currently at the European level that in other uh, federal systems are at the decentral level. Like the, U the U.S. has certain things uh, still uh, devolved to the uh, to the individual states that in Europe are uh, EU competent. So it's not impossible to have less uh, European uh, collaboration in certain areas, uh, as we see from Switzerland and, and other countries. Um, now, uh, I think it would be really uh, uh, up for an open debate, but of course. Um, um, like things like climate change, I think, are clearly something that where, where Europe can create an additional uh, value. It, it doesn't make sense that every country does this on their own. Um, I think that's also perhaps less contested uh, at the moment. But things like, for example, um, like what the welfare state. I mean, we talk about rising social inequality and things like that. Is Europe? Really, I mean, is the EU really the, 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 the right level of addressing these things? Um, I mean, we have national welfare states. They have grown for 100, 150 years. Um, why not leave that to the national level and maybe also leave national welfare states uh, do that? I mean, there's more of a tendency of uh, European market integration of kind of uh, narrowing the, the scope of redistribution and um, 
social benefits that you can offer. Um, so the kind of the logic of free movement of services and things like that uh, uh, impacting on, on the welfare state. So I think it would make sense to, to discuss each of these uh, both functionally but also politically, of course. And so you could also think about like um, things related to migration. I mean, does everything relating to migration, does it have to be European? I mean, we used to have uh, uh, times where um, this was all not Europeanized, right? And so we also could survive. So I think it, it, it's just a matter of um, kind of finding the right balance uh, and not so much, you know, do it alone here or do it alone at the other level, but kind of finding the, the, the right balance. I think that would be my uh, recommendation or suggestion, but it's, it's an open political debate. Thank you. Of course, we will have to deepen these discussions because when you speak about the welfare state or even uh, migration, I mean, there are certain things that are in any event not happening at the European level. And it's all a matter of knowing what exactly would happen, a softish approach, uh, more kind of, you know, best practices, harmonization, unification, uh, exclusive competences versus shared or supporting competence. It really becomes very quickly a, a rather, let's say, um, sophisticated discussion. And then it will be very important for all those citizens to become a little bit aware of all the sophisticated uh, nuances of European law. Uh, conferral of competence and so on and so forth, which we have never realized in the past, so I hope that with this conference we can realize at least that for a greater uh, expansion of knowledge of EU law, you know, great future <laughs> <laughs> for the EU law professors. Okay, we, we, uh, are, we want to stop at two o'clock more or less uh, punctually, so we have a possibility of a very last round of brief questions and with brief answers. So, you go for it. Okay, Mike. And the other mic for the gentleman over there. Zerdes Kostakos from the Foundation for Global Government and Sustainability. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, some comments, because I have been a politician with myself, although an academic at the same time, I think that what you said before about the Greens and the Conservatives, and I come from a conservative part of Greece, and I wanted to see here how they react to climate change and all these things. When you make the discussion as a communitarian issue, then they certainly choose to be conservative and negative towards it. When you start analyzing the issues, then of course you can find the common ground and the common human elements, and you can understand how the climate is not as big. The problem with Europe is that it has not reached at that level, perhaps, of explaining itself to the villages of Sparta, where I come from, or other parts of Greece. <coughs> Uh, for example. So how can we have this opportunity through this conference to really go and have debates at each and every part and explain and have a participation? So that's one thing. And the second is previous examples like the five scenario of Juncker and the process that got started. I don't know where it ended up. People <laughs> had nowhere probably. Also the G1000 here, there is an experience of a group that was elected in some way. In ancient Greece, they had lottery also. So here we studied these examples and see what are their benefits and what would work best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Where is the mic now? The other mic? Okay. You, it's a lottery, so you randomly give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> From, uh, from DG Trade. Thank you for the instructive discussion so far. Now, there's a book in the back of the room, which on the cover page, I think, on the second page, um, has a quote that I've always remembered, namely that the EU's obsession with the internal policy is akin to rearranging the deck chairs on the sinking Titanic. <laughs> and I understand, I come from DG Trade, so I'm biased, but I understand that internal support is crucial for effective external policy. However, the focus on the Conference of the Future of Europe, uh, and this is my question to you, um, do you anticipate that it carries these following two risks to the EU's ability to act externally? First of all, the risk that this will dominate the agenda, both politically and in the media, um, for the coming years that it is underway, and that the EU's foreign policy <coughs> achievements might fly a bit under the radar, thereby the decreasing the popularity of Europe. That's one. And the second risk um, that I see is something that I believe Mr. Uh, Professor Tribe 
commented on, namely the risk of perhaps trading in certain <coughs> of these strong competencies the Union has right now as trade policy in order to make the outcome of the conference politically acceptable uh, later on. Now, to me, from a foreign policy perspective, this uh, seems threatening, but of course I would be very interested more in, uh, in your opinions on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we have to stop here with the questions. I know it's frustrating, but after we end the plenary session, we will have a little bit of a factual agora with some of the panel members, so you can still engage with them. And we can do follow-up events, you know? The project still lasts for another two years. No, I'm, I, I should be. It's not working. It's not working. Okay. Thank you. So, I mean, we have to go back to our panel, and in any event, I wanted to compliment my former student because he's making a quick career. It's an alumnus from KU that is making a quick career in DG Trade. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's turn back to our panel. So, uh, I mean, well, you can skip that. Eh? Yeah, you. just a uh, very small thing about the five uh, scenarios of Juncker. We don't know where they ended up. <laughs> uh, but they, I personally, I find them very useful um, as possibilities. I mean, these are completely possibilities uh, because when they were issued, we were talking a lot about enhanced cooperation, differentiated integration, variable geometry. He uh, has proposed five concrete ways to work uh, on which member states in different configurations have expressed their view. For example, uh, the big four states, Italy, France, Germany, and uh, Spain, they have said they are in favor of enhanced cooperation. Visegrad states, they said they are not. So. At least that is a, a basis for discussion. On the domination of the agenda, personally, I don't know. There is the risk, of course, that this conference will uh, take a bit the floor. But I come back on, uh, on Julia's proposal on the fact that if, uh, I mean, it's just a little gag to finish my, my, my intervention here, that if uh, the European topics take the floor and take the agenda until and uh, take the public discourse until next elections, that would be a good thing, personally, I believe, because so far European elections have been dominated by national, at least in certain states, have been dominated by national uh, discourse. So that is just a little joke to end, but frankly, I, I don't know. That is interrogation mark. And there is, a, there is a Reconnect book coming out with Routledge mm -hmm. about this first-hand analysis of the latest European election in that perspective between, say, second and first order elections. So yeah. we have very interesting empirical material about that coming up. Th that's for a future event. Oliver. Yeah, just very quickly on this question of uh, whether there is a threat to the existing uh, policy competences. I mean, I think if, if there is an open debate, and if you want an open debate, I think you should also be prepared to kind of talk also about the status quo. Um, so, and, and maybe, I, I don't believe that this, this ends up with, you know, giving up uh, common trade policy. It wouldn't make any sense, actually. But I mean, like, we have seen that uh, trade agreements have caused a lot of uh, opposition. And so, finding ways of involving you know, national parliaments more, uh, the European Parliament, etc. I think uh, would also be uh, crucial to, to make that more acceptable and to kind of push this out of the expert levels that then present big packages of uh, reforms that nobody has ever heard of. So um, I think that in that sense, uh, it would also make sense to, to address that. Peter. Thanks. Uh, the question on uh, the resonance of uh, communitarian arguments um, I think the severity of this conflict also provides an opportunity because um, it is easily relatable in all EU member states. So if the EU is able to con come out with this conference with something like, we've heard the cosmopolitans, we've heard the communitarians, here's a proposal to take something from each side and it has something for both. That will easily resonate because this conflict has spread over uh, the entire EU. Okay, to be continued. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to be continued. Julia. Well, also following up on what uh, uh, Peter said on, on that question, uh, well, that's why I was talking about benchmarking, uh, because if you look, for example, at the, the local uh, experience with the J, uh, J1000, sorry, um, well, this shows the limits of the liberative experiments and the usefulness or what can be added by partic participatory democracy instruments uh, compared to the liberative uh, 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 events. 
because in terms of organization and 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 media resonance, that was excellent an excellent uh, uh, exercise. But in terms of output, it was quite limited. And one thing that, on the other hand, can be uh, uh, can be inspired or the inspiration that can come from the G1000 is that the selection process was uh, very peculiar and was representative. I mean, randomly done to represent uh, the Belgian population, but also to over-represent marginalized populations. And that's something that maybe in building up the composition of the future agora must be. Uh, taking that into account to overrepresent uh, uh, lower income uh, population, women, youth, uh, 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 population from immigrant origins, and so on and so forth. Thank you. And now, Ben. Yeah. Um, just uh, responding to the comment on introducing external action, and, and, and the, um, I think one of the big uh, uh, advice I would give is very much <coughs> let's not aspire a comprehensive deal. Let's have packages, let's have thematic packages, and that allows us also to, to discuss different themes. Not too many, um, uh, identified three, four, but I think one of them necessarily has to be indeed the position of the EU in the world, and do we want to be another United States, do we want to be another China, or do we still want to be the kind of international law, multilateral kind of uh, superpower, uh, but I think that should be one of the components, uh, which should not be fully integrated by the others. That brings me to an, another topic, I think, the Green New Deal that we're talking about and that has been launched last week here is, I think, I, I was struck about actually how that launching was um, uh, uh, determined by a focus on money and by regulation. But I think a deal, it's I think about making a deal between indeed the losers and the winners of, of, uh, of globalization, between climate and solidarity, and indeed between innovation. And I think those are very concrete discussions that you can have in Northern Greece. Yeah. So in that sense, I think, the Green New Deal and to substantiate that with a vision rather than just with a, a big bag of money, I think it's something that we can take out across Europe and we can come up with proposals. What does it mean for European societies to be a Green New Deal society? What, and what sacrifices and what choices are we willing to make? I think that's a conversation that you can have across Europe um, and that hasn't been concluded last week, but it's only about to start. And I think the conference in that sense would be a great vehicle for that. Okay. This is about the end because it's past 2 p.m. and we want to respect your busy agendas. Thank you very much for engaging in this very first kind of preliminary discussion about the conference on the future of Europe. I would say stay tuned with the reconnect dynamics because of course our project continues for the next two years. I should already highlight that we may indeed have another event here in this beautiful Norway house for which we're very grateful. On the 16th, Monday the 16th of March, there's going to be the World Justice Report which will be shared with its latest findings and I think that will be very important when we uh, look at the rule of law and democratic um, developments in the world. So please stay tuned in, thank you very much and hope to see you at one of our future events. Many thanks.